Right. Okay, let's get started. Thank you for your patience here. We had a few technological problems here. Let's get going and talk about landscaping in shady areas. And most of us do have shady areas in our home landscape. Maybe it's near a building or underneath a tree. These areas do require special planning, but with the right touch, we can add some fascinating foliage and also some wonderful shades of color. Excuse the pun with the shade. And uh, here to talk to us and share with us her tips on landscaping in shady areas is Esther McGinnis. She is an extension horticulturist for NDSU. Esther, welcome to the forums. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so thank you, Tom. And I have to admit, this is a little bit of a personal journey for me. Now, I've spent the last three and a half, actually, four years here in North Dakota getting settled into my job so it's finally time for me to devote a little bit of time to my own garden so some of this is a personal journey so I have the north side of my house to landscape so we're, we're getting quite a bit of quite a bit of shade actually deep shade to light shade um, so here are some of the design tips that I'm thinking oops here we go Okay, but the, the first thing to keep in mind is that um, gardening in full sun is a different beast than gardening in the shade. I would argue that gardening in full sun is a little bit easier. You could just select perennials that uh, provide this riot of color, and you don't have to think as much about the details. But the same is not true for a shade garden. So shade gardening is more sophisticated because you have to think about the nuances. How do you add interest in the shade? Um, you do it by looking at contrast. So we're going to talk about three kinds of contrast, color contrast, texture, and form. So first, it's color. So making the shade just light up. You can do that with foliage plants like the coleus and that Persian shield that is just peeking out from under that hosta. But you can also do so with flowering plants too. Texture. I would argue that texture is the most important of the three. Now you're looking at this picture and you'll notice not a whole lot of color, just kind of some blues and greens here, but it's still very much alive. It's a very vibrant scene and that's because of the texture. We have a contrast between fine and coarse. The fine texture is represented by the fern on the left hand side and that nicely uh, contrasts with the coarse texture of the hosta. You'll see the hosta has that really large leaf. And then if you look up in the background, we've got a Boston ivy with those three lobes on the leaves, but it gives it a, a wavy effect. So even without much color, we have a lot of interest in this photo thanks to texture. And then form. Form is how your eye is drawn through this picture. Um, so creeping ground covers would draw your eye horizontally. Uh, hostas and other mounding plants give it kind of a rounded, pleasing form. And then there are other plants that will draw the eye upward. So more of a vertical emphasis like the Ligularia in this picture. First, let's talk about color. When well, I'm going to talk about a color that is not on the color wheel. And that is white. So white is a color without hue. And I would argue that green and white contrasts are some of the most beautiful um, contrasts that you'll see in the shade garden. So this happens to be a photo from Clemens and Munsinger Gardens in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Now if you're on your way to the Twin, so Twin Cities and have a couple hours, I would advise to stop and see these beautiful public gardens, you know, take your lunch and wander through them. But this is the all-white garden and take a look at this picture. Now, what draws your eye in this picture? Now, arguably, it's the Annabelle hydrangea. So Annabelle hydrangeas are the star of white gardens. Um, they're suitably hardy for North Dakota, being zone three hardy, great in part sun to part shade, so very adaptable. But there's one flaw about the Annabelle hydrangea that I would argue. So I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with Annabelle hydrangea. Love the big balls of flowers. Um, but 
but I hate the fact that it lodges. It falls over. Those stems just cannot support those big balls of flour. So thankfully, there's a new cultivar on the market. I think it's been on the market probably about five years or so called Incredible. And fortunately, this is better than the species. It's been bred to have a bigger ball of flowers, but at the same time, it has a really stiff, sturdy stem, so it's less likely to flop. So that's the first thing that I'm going to put into my new garden. Now, other plants that give you that beautiful green and white color combination would be variegated Solomon seal. So this was the 2013 perennial plant of the year. Now, hopefully you've heard of the Perennial Plant Association. They name one plant every year, and it has to be a plant that's not a prima donna. It has to be a plant that survives through most of the country, it's low maintenance, and is usually resistant to different pests and diseases. So variegated Solomon seal fits the bill and was chosen in 2013. Well, take a look at this close-up. I mean, it almost looked like, like an artist took a paintbrush and just outlined the margins of the leaves. There are no two leaves that are the same. And I took this picture right after a May rainstorm, so you could see the raindrops just hanging off of those white flowers. They're bell-shaped. And eventually, they'll ripen into berries that are blue. Now, if you have kids, you may want to cut off the berries because the berries can be a little toxic. But if, you, if you're not worried because you don't have kids at home, then um, allow the berries to ripen because that does add a little bit of color. So variegated Solomon seal. Um, it does spread a little bit by rhizomes, but it's not bad at all. It's easily maintained. Brunera macrophylla sea heart. So this is a newer cultivar of Brunera that's been on the market for a, a little bit of time. And this just glows in the shade. It lights up the shade with silvery leaves. Um, so this is really good in part shade. Now, you don't want to have too much sun exposure on this because it will burn the leaves, but it's great in part shade. Now, I have zone four with the question mark, and the question mark indicates that we're not quite sure how far north we can go in North Dakota. I've seen it growing successfully in Bismarck and in Fargo, but we don't know how far we can push it. Now, if you're living um, north of I-94, you may want to consider mulching it until you start to figure out how hardy is this plant for you. <clears throat> what I love about it are the flowers. So this happens to be a seedling, but it would have the same flowers. They're just sky blue, just a wonderful welcome to spring, and it blooms in May. Now, you don't have to just plant perennials. There are annuals that can certainly um, supplement the perennials in your garden. So this is polka dot plant. This is, an, this is a plant that's been around for a while, and it does come in other colors. But this, this one has that nice white uh, appearance to it. So very economical to plant. You can buy a four pack and um, you know, purchase quite a few of them, and they'll, they'll form a nice kind of ground cover for you. So on with the green and white theme, of course, hostas. So I'm not going to talk about all the different hosta cultivars. I would bet that there are people in this audience that are way, have way more expertise than I do about hosta cultivars. I'm sure there are lots of you that collect them. What I'm going to talk about is variegation. So you ha have all different kinds of variegation with hostas. You've got Vulcan on the left, which has, which has that beautiful splotch right in the center of the leaf. And then on the right-hand side, you have El Nino, um, which has a, a bluer leaf with white variegation on the edge. You know, there are all sorts of hostas with different kinds of variegation. But I would tell you to use variegation sparingly. Um, now, if you look at this photo, you have more of the plain green and blue hostas, and then you have the variegated in the middle, and that just provides interest. Now, don't overuse variegation. I used to drive by this driveway that had uh, variegated hostas lining both sides, and it was too much. It was just too busy. So use variegation sparingly to inject energy into it. And I would argue this is too much variegation. To me, this is just too busy. 
Um, for me, when I plant a shade garden, I think it has to have a little bit of a serene nature to it. I think shade gardens are, are pretty much a sanctuary for us. So using too much variegation, it, it detracts from that. Now going on to some serious color. So here we have some coleus and some orange impatience. Now these are colors that I was told uh, as a child never to use together. Never use orange, never use pink together. But I tell you, all the landscapers are using this in a color combination now because it is so vibrant, so much energy. Now we'll first talk about foliage plants that inject color into your landscape and then we'll switch to the flowers. So caladiums are hot. They're really hot. There's been a lot of breeding lately. Some people call these elephant ears, but there's so many different colors that you can buy. So this will take part sun to part shade, so quite adaptable as far as sun requirements. Well, part sun being like six hours, part shade being about four hours of sun. But the important thing to remember with caladiums is that it's very much a warm season annual for us. It doesn't like temperatures below 60 degrees. So wait till June to put it out. You know, bring it into the garage or into the house if you have it in a pot, and then plant it in June. And then it's really going to thrive during the heat of the summer. And remember, it also grows from a tuber. Those tubers will rot if you put it in standing water or saturated soils, so plant it in a well-drained area. And of course, if we're talking foliage plants, we have to talk about coleus. Coleus has changed, so don't just assume that you can willy-nilly buy coleus and put it in your shade garden. There are sun-tolerant coleus uh, cultivars, and then they're also shade-tolerant. So read the label. Very important to see you know, just where does it fit within your landscape, and then select accordingly. But you're going to see that there are some really strange coleus out there. Um, Horticulture is leading the way with a series called Coleus Under the Sea. And everything in the Coleus Under the Sea resembles some sea creature. So I swear, these are all mutant coleus. This one is supposed to look like seaweed. There's another one out there called lime shrimp. <laughs> so Google it, it's just kind of fun. So you're gonna to start to see more of these mutant type coleus. So you may be asking, why do I want this in my garden? It's for those gardeners that always have to have something new and novel. You want your neighbors to come over and ask, what is that? Well, this certainly fits the bill. More traditional coleus would be like Hurricane Jenny here. And the contrast just within this one plant are just amazing. To have the chartreuse in the interior, and then burgundy, and then lined again with a little bit of chartreuse. Just stunningly beautiful. And then my old favorite is fishnet stockings. You gotta like the name. Um, but this is truly just a beautiful coleus. You have a green leaf, and then each vein is outlined in burgundy. It's just just very uniform and very beautiful. Now this one can take a little bit more sun, but this has been around for, for quite a few years, but it's still one of my favorites. And then here we have coleus paired with a dragon wing begonia. So everybody thinks that, okay, if I have a dragon wing begonia, I have to put it in a hanging basket. Well, it does look beautiful in a hanging basket, but you could certainly also plant it in the landscape. So here you can see how beautiful it is. And it would definitely look better more towards the front of that landscape. Whoops. Here we go. Okay. Heuchera. All right, so we can't talk foliage plants without talking about heuchera. So heuchera is kind of borderline hardy for us, and that's where we come in. So I'm trying to kill plants so you don't have to waste your money. Uh, so we are researching heuchera hardiness in Fargo, in Absaraca, and Williston. The problem with heuchera is frost heaving. So we're trying to see which ones survive. Now, unfortunately, I don't have shade environments in which to test them. So they really get a workout there in full sun. Um, now, we'll be collecting our second year's worth of data here this spring. But I can tell you off the bat, the one that I like so far is Midnight Rose. It has a burgundy leaf. 
um, with splotches of pink on it. And unfortunately, this photo just doesn't do it justice. But this one has done well, did well for us during the first year of the trial. All right, switching over to flowers from foliage plants, Growalia or amethyst flower. So this can inject some purple into your landscape. Amethyst flower is underutilized. I see it sold, but I see so few people planting it. Um, this will take part shade to really even deep shade. Um, so something fun uh, to plant along with your hostas and other uh, perennials. Terrania or wishbone flower. Now this is one of my favorites. Uh, I just usually buy um, the ground cover kinds. Now there are others that are more of a vining that you would use um, in a hanging basket, but I just buy the ones that come in the four or the six pack and they do really nicely. And I use them like other people would use standard impatience. I plant a, a ton of them so they look like a, a colorful ground cover. So this will take part shade to pretty deep shade, but it needs to have evenly moist soil. So you do have to irrigate this one. So here we've got standard impatience. Used to be the number two bedding plant in the country, but we're seeing that its popularity is diminished because of disease issues. Some of you may have encountered impatience downy mildew, um, and your extension agents most likely have a, a publication in their offices um, on it. So standard impatience and balsam impatience subject to impatience downy mildew. So we're seeing more people switching to resistant species like New Guinea impatience or planting the sun patience series, which is a hybrid or bounce or big bounce impatience. Now they are resistant to um, impatience downy mildew. So here we have you know, nice color contrast going on, um, you know, with the reds. Um, the reds and then our white alyssums, begonia, and then of course the spike. And then don't forget salvias. So most people think, oh, salvias have to be full sun. And that's true for most of the salvias. The exception would be salvia splendens. Here you see it's thriving in an environment with the ferns, um, are growing in part shade to full sun. And then we have begonia boliviensis, my favorite. Um, hanging basket type of plant. Begonia boliviensis has more of these strap-like flowers and foliage. All right, so I better get on to texture here. Uh, so it's contrasting coarse and fine textures um, to provide that interest. Japanese painted fern. So the ferns can really provide that fine texture um, when it's contrasted with something with a thicker leaf. So Japanese painted fern also has colors. So it has silvers and blues in it. And then the veins are usually a little bit on the red side. This will take part to full shade in zone four. Um, it does like rich humusy soils. Onoclea sensibilis or sensitive fern. Consider planting natives. This is a native fern, native to North Dakota. Now we frequently find these in marshes but I'm seeing landscape designers putting these into um, regular garden landscapes. As long as they're irrigated and in deep shade, they do quite nicely. But this has a completely different texture, the texture being coarser than the Japanese painted fern. And Virginia. Virginia has a coarse texture, more like what you would find with a hosta. This has kind of a, a funny name. It's called pipsqueak makes a sound when you rub your hand on the foliage. But this is a, pretty much a three season plant for us. You get your pink flowers in the spring, you get the beautiful foliage through summer, and then in the fall you'll see red coloration. So an actual perennial that'll color up in the fall. My favorite of the uh, coarse textured plants would be Brit Marie Crawford, which is a ligularia. It has those beautiful purple leaves along with wine red stems um, just just adds a really deep element to the garden. For a finer texture we have master wort here related to the uh, to carrots actually it's in the APACA family but here you see the finely dissected foliage with the dainty flowers. And then don't forget grasses. So now, I, I tell people ornamental grasses are for full sun, but 
but this is the exception. Tufted hair grass, you can take into part shade and it will do quite nicely. Um, it's a, a cool season grass, so it'll start blooming in June. So you'll have seed heads quite early in the season. All right, I better zoom into form. So with form, we're talking about how the eye is drawn through the garden. Now I've shown you a lot of plants that are mounding or ground cover like, so we're gonna focus on adding verticality in the garden, like with the rocket. So the rocket has those beautiful yellow spires of flowers, um, so they draw the eye upward, a nice complement to all the other more mounding types of plants. So the rocket, uh, this is a little bit of a trickier plant. I'm not going to lie to you about it. You need to have part to full shade because this plant will wilt um, if it's getting too much sun. It does need evenly moist soils. I mean, the joke about this plant is it'll wilt even if it's growing in a bog. So a little bit, little bit more care is required to keep this looking healthy, um, but it, it does, it does wilt a little bit, just physiologically speaking. Um, but it does perk up at night. Now, if if that wilting turns you off, there are newer cultivars, Bottle Rocket and Little Rocket. They're a little less uh, maintenance, and then of course they're more compact as our yards are shrinking. Couple more plants to draw the eye upward. We have Thalictrum. So this is, an, this is an unusual one. This is going to add a lot of height to your shade garden. So with Thalictrum, it's going to be four or five feet tall and it's going to have dainty foliage because it's related to Columbine. So take a look at that, that foliage. And then it's going to have these spring pink types of flowers, but it's blooming in midsummer. So something very different. Uh, that can tower above your hostas and add that verticality. And then don't forget astilbes. There are more and more astilbes on the market, all sorts of cultivars. Just remember, these really do need a fair amount of shade and moist soils, and they'll reward you um, with beautiful blooms, with these beautiful spires on them. And you see how this contrasts very nicely with the round shape of the Annabelle hydrangea in the back. So remember, um, as you're planting your garden, think about contrasting colors and textures and form to add interest in the shade. And one last tip, think about planting in mass. Not one plant here and another species there. Think in threes, multiples, think in multiples. So three is a minimum, and, and that will just bring a sense of cohesiveness to the garden, adding some rhythm to it. So I hope that this has helped you, you know, as you plan your shade garden. Happy gardening. Okay, great. Thank you, Esther. Oh, they're beautiful shady areas. My goodness. Okay, we got a few questions here, and we invite more questions from the audience. How about you, sh you showed Solomon's seal. Is that the same as Lily of the Valley? No, it is not. Um, Solomon's seal um, is polygonatum. And um, it's going to be in a different genus than lily of the valley. Lily of the va valley is invasive. It, it will just spread and take over. A Solomon seal is completely different. Um, it will spread just a little bit, but you can keep it in check. It doesn't have the aggressive tendencies of lily of the valley. And it's going to be a little bit taller, more like 18 to 24 inches. Okay, how about... Uh when you landscape under trees, do you have to worry about keeping the soil too wet you know, to maintain your shady perennials, for example? Yes, yes. I do worry about that. Um, first of all, it's a tough environment for the perennials because they're competing with the roots of the trees. So then people overcompensate by overwatering, which then starts to suffocate the tree roots. So I tell people to, to tread lightly when they are uh, around the tree roots. I don't like to see too many plants um, too close to the tree roots. Do you have any tips on how do you go about planting under a tree? Well, the first thing is don't add extra soil because we don't want you to smother those tree roots. Um, but, you know, the further out you can go, the better it is. Um, and the more likely that you will have 
um, better luck. So, you know, not, not right up against the trunk either. I mean, so come out a little ways and then, you know, dig around a little bit, see where the, see where the roots are. You don't want to, you don't want to be disturbing that and you don't want to be adding soil because when you add soil, you're smothering the tree roots. So I, I really like, don't like to see too many flowers around the base of the tree. Just come out a ways. Okay, good. Uh, do you have any opinions on goat's beard? Goat's beard, um, a runcus, I think. Um, so goat's beard, you know, that's another nice one, and it has kind of a similar appearance to a stilby. Um, so that's that's another good one to add. I only had 20 minutes. I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's my fault. Sorry. So you can blame Tom for I only totally giving me 20 minutes. Sorry. <laughs> um, how about, is there an ivy that will grow in shade in North Dakota? Well, there was that Boston ivy. Um, so Parthenocystis, uh, was it Tricuspidata will, will grow in shade? Now, be a little careful because it, it will cement itself to brick surfaces, and once it does so, you're not going to be able to get it off. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely one that you can grow a little bit in shade. Okay, here's a plant for you never heard of. I've never heard of, so please, <laughs> I hope you have. How about Simicifuga? C-I-M-I-C, -I -I -C. got it? Yes, okay, yes, beautiful. Black Cohosh, Simicifuga. Black That's a great one for verticality. So that that has those white spires, four to five feet tall with maroon foliage. Um, I think that's going to be more of a zone four, but that is another one that adds that sense of height. Uh, so I, I like that one too. I had that one um, when I was living in Minnesota. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Sorry again, we can't. It was my fault. I limited all the you know slides here tonight. So. <laughs> Uh, we can have a we can have a landscaping session later and you know, talk more about this. How about uh, Solomon seal? Do those berries make a mess in the yard? Um, I don't think the berries make a mess in the yard, but if you're worried, you know, after it blooms, you can cut them off. But I never had a problem; they just kind of stayed there. Uh, but when my daughter was younger and I was worried about her wandering in the garden and putting something in her mouth, I did clip off the berries because they're a little on the toxic side. I don't know how toxic, but I didn't want to take the chance. How about uh, anemone? Do you know what growing zones recommended for that? There are different kinds of anemone. My favorite one, um, anemone hy hybrida, uh, robustissima is my favorite cultivar. That is a zone four, although I've heard people push it into zone three. It, it's a fall blooming anemone that has um, pink flowers and the leaves are kind of, look like a grape leaf um, with, with the silvery underside. Love it, I just planted that one last fall. Great. Okay, another one you, you said you like is incredible hydrangea. Now, are those blooms as white as those of Annabelle hydrangea? You know, I guess I haven't looked that closely to see if they're more beige as opposed to white. You know, I, I really don't know for sure. Okay. Um, how about in catalogs, you see sometimes you see parts shade, full shade, part sun. Like, can you define how many hours of sun and shade are we talking about or morning versus afternoon? Great question. So let's start off with which is kind of full shade would be two hours of sunlight. Part shade would be about four hours. Part sun would be six hours of light. And then full sun would be eight or more hours of light. Okay. How about uh, that anemone you said uh, really interested somebody. What was that favorite cultivar again you mentioned? Robustissima. <laughs> R O B U S T I S S I M A. Okay. There are newer ones on the market. I think. Oh, is that I, the species name? That is the cultivar. That's the cultivar. I, I think it might be Anemone X hybrida. So it might wow. be an interspecific hybrid. Wow. I'm sure if we just Google Robustissima anemone, that, that'll get you in the right direction. Um, any other questions out there? Mm -hmm. 
There's a general question about gardening under a tree. Any special considerations? Well, That's a hard question. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's a so hard general. one. So I'll tell you what I have planted under trees that has been okay. Now this is not going to be a flop. It's this is not about the flowers. There are some people that want to have a ground cover that will work uh, under the shade of trees. Um, so I'd recommend something called Pennsylvania Sedge or Carex Pennsylvanica as a ground cover. Now this is going to look more like a grass, and that I have grown successfully under you know tall tall pine trees. It's done well in that dry, shady area. Um, but then, of course, these are areas where the grass won't grow because it's too shady. But this happens to be a forest sedge, so it's used to taking kind of that shady environment. So I've planted that under, under maple trees. I've planted it under uh, pine trees, and it's done really well in that dry, shady area. Okay, good. We have a, a few questions on hostas. Uh, there's a comment that they think hostas is like an acidic soil. Is that true? Well, like. now hostas are originally native to Japanese forests, so maybe they, they come from an acidic soil, but they are very much uh, very well adapted to North Dakota because, I mean, we grow them everywhere. Uh, we grow them in soils that are, are eight and above, and they do just fine. Right. So I've never seen a nutrient deficiency yeah. in a hosta. Yeah, they're very almost indestructible, except for sometimes somebody says somebody's eating their hosta. You know what, what that could be? Not somebody, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> Probably toxic. <laughs> Hungry neighbor. No, no slugs. You're slugs. talking slugs. Okay, what, do you wanna, what can we do about those slugs? Well, there are different, uh, there are different measures that you can take. Um, the first thing is oh, first cleaning up the debris under the hostas or other shade plants. You know, so good hygiene goes a long way. So you're removing the dead foliage. Um, the next line of defense, I mean, you can certainly sprinkle some diatomaceous earth. So these are little uh, marine diatoms. It's their skeletons full of silicon and it will actually tear the bodies of those slugs as they crawl across uh, the diatomaceous earth. But it only works as long as that diatomaceous earth remains dry. Um, so if you're getting a lot of rain, what do you do? There's some people that have, are talking about using copper, um, copper strips around their plants. Now, I've never tried that, but it's something I've started reading about. Um, and the other thing would be go chemical. There's an iron phosphate product, actually a couple of them, called escargo and sluggo, um, that tend to be a little less toxic than our older uh, pesticide, which was made from metaldehyde. So how did you know that answer when you haven't had a slug question for six months? Well, you're, <laughs> you're already in your, your summer form already, Esther. I can't believe that. You already named the product just like that. It's just the grounds is thawing. You're ready for you're ready for those garden questions, aren't you? <laughs> how about, uh, <laughs> how about uh, where do you get all these wonderful plants from, my goodness sakes? What, you know, like, uh, do you have any, how would you go about it? Is there a certain nursery around the state that would have them or go online or do you have any oh, yeah. advice for that? I have to admit, I have a good job because I get to travel around the state and I get to visit nurseries too. So I pick up nurseries all around the state. But I'm not shy about ordering online. I'll order plants online too. Um, but I do like to try and visit my local uh, garden centers, particularly the independent garden centers. I do like to give them my business because I want them to be around when I need them. Okay. How about do you have a favorite type of mulch? Well, you're going to laugh at me, Tom. <laughs> well, it won't be the first time. <laughs> 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 my old, fa I'll tell you my old favorite mulch, which I could get away with in the Twin Cities, was the cocoa bean mulch. We did not have the wind that we have here uh, in North Dakota, so it didn't blow away. It just helped enrich the soil. It would break down every year. Um, and I tell you, it would attract kids like you wouldn't believe. You'd start spreading this around. It smells like chocolate, and all the neighborhood kids would show up. <laughs> but that doesn't work as well unless you're in a shaded I mean, if you, unless you're in a sheltered area, so I'm, I'm back to using wood mulch now, so it won't blow away. 
So why do you like kids? Did they help you pull weeds or something? Or <laughs> what are you tracking kids for? I tried. Yeah, I okay. really tried. <laughs> That's a very fair game. How about, uh, do these type of gardens work when they're planted into spruce tree needles under a spruce tree? Um, so I would say no. I, don't, I wouldn't do it right under a spruce tree. Um, you want to go out beyond the drip line because um, it's just going to be too shady and you're not going to be able to see it. Now, of course, there are some of you that have limbed up your uh, spruce trees. I mean, that's a little bit different. But keep in mind, that's a really tough, competitive environment under those spruce trees. They're really sucking up a lot of water. So the further you can come out, the better. I mean, you can still have the shade from the spruce trees, but I, I wouldn't plant too close um, to the base of it. Okay, that's excellent. Any last questions out there in the counties? Okay, being none, Esther, thank you for that wonderful talk. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Even in the shady area, there's so much hope for shaded areas now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to start learning about attracting butterflies, everybody. So we'll get, take a quick break.